Welcome, everybody. Uh, great to see you all again. Thank you for returning. And uh, for those who are newly here, I hope uh, this is uh, helpful. And uh, we very, very much look forward to, to your participation in this. This is the fourth session of an eight week uh, course on digital Catholic social teaching, DCST. Today, we're going to be talking about human dignity in the second week of the first pillar of Catholic social teaching. And this time we're gonna focus on the topic of artificial humanity. Now, I just wanna remind you <clears throat> that the material we're going over here, this is the first time that much of this material has ever been presented publicly. This is not material you're going to find in other people's work. Uh, Srikant has in the past uh, warned you, there's a fire hose of ideas here. Hopefully we're able to build on some of the earlier sessions, um, but by appending digital to a term that is very widely used, we have quite deliberately shifted the focus. So the Center for the Study of Digital Life is a unique organization because it considers digital to be a technology that has introduced a completely new environment. And in that environment, unlike the previous electric slash television environment, the priorities change. Our understanding of the world changes. What we think of as environments changes. And the key to that is in fact artificial humanity. So whereas under electric conditions, the natural environment as it was threatened by industrialization had became a very big deal. So Earth Day is, began in 1970. So this is a very old story. We've had um, massive organization of uh, nation states and uh, mobilizations around the world to deal with the natural environment that is no longer the fundamental concern. Rather, the fundamental concern going forward is associated with this field of artificial humanity. I expect that that distinction will stimulate a number of questions from you, which we look forward to. Next slide, please. What is this digital environment we're talking about? Well, as you might recall from last week's session, we describe two fundamental relationships between technological environments, containing and retrieving. So the previous electric slash television environment is no longer the ground of our experience. It has been subsumed and is contained within the digital environment. So we have, in a, in a sense, we have demoted electric and television. They no longer have the same impact on us. Everyone here uh, knows this to one degree or another. Our children, grandchildren know it even more. So it doesn't take you very far in terms of age groups to find groups who just simply do not watch television anymore. That was the electric environment. It still drives global affairs to a very large degree, <clears throat> but it now has become the contents of a new environment. The electric environment in turn, as you recall, contained its previous environment, which was print. We're not doing that anymore. Secondly, the digital environment retrieves something different. So its contents are different and its retrieval is different. And specifically what it retrieves is that period in human civilizational history. In fact, it is the origin of civilizations, which was the ability to have an audience of readers for scribal works, which were most importantly, of course, sacred books. That's a radical difference 
from the oral world. For example, for those of you who may be interested in Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson, as you know, uh, has become a, a prominent public intellectual. Um, what is probably not quite so clear is that Jordan Peterson built his work on Carl Jung. Carl Jung's notion of archetypes, and I imagine that there are some folks on this call who are quite knowledgeable about Jung. What Jung proposed with his archetypes was an oral environment being retrieved. So the notion that there are, in quotes, stories that are archetypal is not a print idea. It's not a scribal idea. It is an oral idea. So the retrieval of oral is built into Jung as well as many other aspects of our lives, but certainly the Jordan Peterson world. Uh, the digital environment is unique in the sequence of oral, scribal, print, electric, and now digital that we discussed last week, because it is based on the memory architecture of digital systems. Now, this is probably not so well understood, particularly by those who are not uh, technically inclined, and in particular, inclined towards the hardware of digital systems. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago uh, with my colleague, uh, Peter Berkman, we put on a salon uh, and the first question was, what does a computer do all day long? It turns out that computers do not compute. They spend almost all, they do a little bit of computing, but it's a small component. They are primarily moving things around in memory. Memory is a hierarchy of systems, but as all of us know, when you're buying a cell phone, when you're buying a PC, when you're upgrading a digital system, memory tends to be the primary question in terms of what you wind up installing. That is because digital systems cannot tolerate mistakes. They cannot tolerate not knowing where something is. They cannot tolerate the kind of precision of memory. Obviously, very different from human memory, which is not precise and is not organized around addresses. And yet, this environment brings us into the realm as an extension of our own capabilities in the same way that television was an extension of our imagination. Digital is an extension of our human memory. In order for this to happen in the digital environment, a massive rebalancing away from fantasy to memory, which we've talked about in earlier sessions, is already underway. This is not something where I'm advocating that we need to go walking down the middle of the street with a memory sign uh, and convince people of this. It happens anyway. It happens to our subconscious as we conform our own internal senses to the technology architectures that we habitually use to communicate. So the more people use digital systems without any deliberate effort on their own part, they will be shifted in their internal sensory balance towards memory. And the primary effect in our view of this effort to build artificial humans is forcing us to restore our understanding of human psychology. We'll get into this in some more detail. Next slide, please. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I'll be very interested to see as the Q&A develops here, how people deal with this question. Are human beings information processors? It may not surprise you to learn that that is the absolutely dominant academic scientific view of a human being today. If you do not believe that humans are information processors, you are 
shuffled off to the side. There is no mainstream social scientific effort that I'm aware of that denies that human beings are information processors. And yet that is fundamentally wrong. We are not information oriented. We are in fact form oriented. We've talked about this before. So we wind up being form recognizers, not information processors. Now, this notion of our being information processors is a relatively new one, not surprisingly. The whole field of computer sciences and more particularly cybernetics, which my father was deeply involved with as a protege of Norbert Wiener together and a few other people, they invented the term cybernetics. That happened in the late 40s. It began to, to get some traction in the 50s. So it wasn't until the late 1950s that cognitive psychology moved in as the scientific experimental replacement for the earlier behaviorism. So um, we all remember uh, various characters, uh, Skinner, Pavlov, and so forth. They got replaced by Don Norman and a whole series of other people. Most of the names you would read on bestseller lists who are dealing with psychology. Jordan Peterson is an interesting exception to this because Jordan Peterson is keen off of Carl Jung. Carl Jung is, is not of cognitive psychology or behaviorism. So he, he is an, uh, an interesting side story, but the other psychologist that gets a fair amount of attention in some circles, uh, John Vervenke, uh, he's a cognitive uh, psychologist. His friends are all cognitive psychologists. They talk that way as if we were information processors. That cannot be true. Information theory struggled to deal with, in particular, the notion of entropy, the notion of the second law of thermodynamics and its relationship to life. This is where I intersect this story. So I'm an old man now, but when I was a teenager and I was going from high school to college, it was in that time period in my life where I first seriously wrestled with these questions and came to the conclusion that the way that information theory tried to explain life in relationship to entropy could not be correct. There are a few other people who have taken that notion and run with it. George Gilder is an infinite, a good example of that as he's attempted to redefine the second law around the principle of life. So is the universe to be thought of as primarily a dead thing or a living thing? And can we somehow figure out how to make dead things and living things really on some sort of a continuum? That is occupied an enormous amount of effort in the 20th century and in our estimation has failed. Why would anybody want to do that? Why would anybody want to think that humans are information processors? I believe the principal answer to that question is they are trying to build a new human nature, reform humans. It's not good enough to reform economics, politics. You have to actually reform the human nature. And many attempts have been made to systematize, if not mathematize, biology. So I know Bill Frezza, because I've talked with him about this, um, uh, is fascinated uh, with the whole uh, Mathematica world and a new kind of science and Wolfram and so forth. And that got me uh, rereading some Wolfram uh, this week. Wolfram winds up answering the hard question here by uh, punting. So he's not willing to step away from the incorrect notion that everything in the universe is computation. It's not. But he does recognize that effectively everything interesting about nature cannot be reduced computationally. So computational irreducibility, if you remember uh, from Wolfram's New Kind of Science, is his answer to the questions that we're dealing with here. What is being ignored in these efforts and will now need to be restored 
is a recognition of forms, not patterns. Computer information processors can be programmed to recognize patterns. That is the basis of much of AI. The difficulty that they have already recognized to a degree is that that's simply not good enough. What is they don't quite grasp, as best I can tell, uh, I stay in touch with the AI developments and would recommend for those of you who wish to do this, the Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence uh, Group at Stanford University is very aggressive in outreaching and workshops and annual conferences. That's probably the best way if you wish to stay up to date with this, but I will challenge you to find anybody there speaking the language of form, and in particular, what we call the soul in English is the form of a human being, not a computer. Next slide, please. So let's put this in some larger context. Um, AI Superpowers is the name of a um, best-selling book by a Chinese computer scientist and AI expert coming out of Carnegie Mellon in the US uh, by the name of Kai Fu Li. <clears throat> He's a very smart man. I recommend that you pay attention to what he has to say, but it is all couched in terms of effectively the East, China versus the West. And who will win this race? Many people, uh, all the way up through, for me, fascinating case of Henry Kissinger, have suggested that whoever wins this race, which is absolutely an arms race, will wind up on top in the, in the uh, 21st century. <coughs> Excuse me. But I've added here the third. And so we have, in addition to the traditional East and West, and this is very much in the news, of course, as uh, uh, President Biden uh, winds up talking with President Xi uh, for a couple of hours and, and all sorts of uh, accounts uh, of uh, the relationship there and, and how Russia and, and Ukraine fit into all of this. What all of that, if you will, uh, standard, almost boilerplate geopolitics ignores is that in fact, there is a third sphere playing in this game. And that third sphere we'll talk about in some more detail later on in this uh, session. That is the digital sphere. They have not yet recognize that, although the approach to dealing with it is very inter interesting and different between East and West. But by, what do I mean by an arms race? Well, it's very straightforward. As we keep hearing in the news every day, um, the hope in the West is that dead Russians will force Putin to end this conflict. That's not gonna happen. I believe, but still the question of dead human beings has long been on the minds of every military in the world. And so they are already, so some of the weapons now being used have no human guidance at all. The switchblade is an interesting uh, example. Um, and uh, a lot more of this is coming. Militaries of the world every one of them are trying to figure out how to not put human beings into combat and instead to use AI in combat. We're at the very beginning of that process, but 10 years from now, uh, probably sooner, this will be very evident. Uh, there's also a very significant imperative on the part of businesses to replace human beings with robots. Uh, Obviously, COVID has highlighted many of these problems. Human beings can walk off the job. Human beings can get sick. Human beings can organize into trade unions. Human beings can't work all day long and so forth. Robots, no problem. So the imperative on the part of both militaries and business organizations, which are together 
clearly the most powerful. So military industrial complex is an interesting term abstracted from Eisenhower's farewell address, but it is that military industrial combination who ultimately require robots instead of humans. This, this is a imperative that is not going to be stopped. Uh, one of the more interesting organizations that has put, been put together to try to deal with this question, at least superficially, comes out of MIT. It's called the Future of Humanity Institute. It's run by uh, MIT faculty member by the name of Max Tegmark, funded with a $10 million open-ended grant from Elon Musk. The intended purpose of this institute was to stop RoboCop or to stop robots with more lethal weapons in warfare. And so an important conference occurred a couple of years ago at the uh, Selmore uh, Conference Center out in Monterey. So you, I will be uh, catching up on my bibliographies for those of you who've been paying attention to the broader project in which this is embedded to build scribal hyperbooks. And so you'll have references to all of these things. The last point on this slide is an obscure one, I'm sure to most people. Human beings, if they're not information processors, then what are they? What, what do they actually uh, wrestle with? And it is our belief, uh, which I won't elaborate on to any great degree, we can talk about it in Q and A if you'd like, is that human beings are considered to be energy amplifiers in Chinese culture. And that energy is not the same sort of thing that physics wrestles with. In China in particular, it's called qi, uh, typically written uh, qi. So I believe embedded within the expression AI superpowers, particularly since that's the term used by Kai Fu Li, who is Chinese, American educated, but culturally he's Chinese, um, that there's a, uh, there are levels below the surface here that are being worked on behind the scenes. Obviously an arms race with labor force impact of this sort is not likely to be something that you headline for your research. So a great amount of material is being gathered uh, to some extent um, on false pretenses here. Next slide, please. Um, let's see, Norbert Wiener, Philip K. Dick, and Herbert Dreyfus. I don't know if uh, Wiener or Dreyfus are names that are well known with, in this group. My guess is that uh, Philip K. Dick is well known here. But I will note for you that these are probably three of the more important people who've been worried about this shift to artificial humanity. Norbert Wiener was a um, American born uh, Jewish mathematician, uh, spent most of his uh, professional career at MIT. Uh, he was my father's mentor. So Wiener is particularly well known uh, to me. So I'll explain a little bit about him. Uh, Philip T. Dick, of course, uh, was is best known as a science fiction writer. Um, uh, Minority Report, uh, a number of other movies have been made based on his novels, but perhaps most famously, we have Blade Runner and its sequels and so forth. And uh, Herbert Dreyfus is probably least well known. Uh, he was a Berkeley Heidegger scholar who jumped in um, with a, a series of books and made some very strong statements. The Human Use of Human Beings, published by Norbert Wiener in 1950, has been very important in my life, because my father, Wiener's protege, handed that assignment to me. So to a significant amount, what we're dealing with here today is me carrying out that assignment. The Human Use of Human Beings, first published in 1950, 
alas, has probably been read by a surprisingly few number of people because Wiener was brought up on potential charges for objecting to this robotic future. And he was compelled to rewrite the book. The 1954, in quotes, second edition is a radically different book from the first one. You can still find copies of the 1950 edition as, in used bookstores, but he was quite relentless about the dangers of all of this. In particular, as I've written about in some essays that, that I've composed on the topic, his greatest concern was that human beings would be either so um, intellectually lazy or so not courageous there enters in a very interesting topic of uh, virtue, which, by the way, we'll be talking about next week uh, as we begin to uh, look at the topic of subsidiarity. Uh, do androids dream of electric sheep? Of course, uh, is the Philip K. Dick, which was made a novel, which was made into um, Blade Runner. Uh, as it turns out, for those of you who remember uh, that story, and by the way, the movie. Um, removes some critical elements that Dick put into the novel. So I recommend to you, if you want to know the full story, go back and read the actual novel. As often the case, Hollywood uh, slashes out major parts of the plot. But as it turns out, Philip K. Dick was deeply concerned, not about robots, but humans. His concern was that humans were not able to uh, be compassionate. This has turned out uh, in a robot company now headquartered in um, Hong Kong called Hanson Robotics. You probably are familiar with the um, Android uh, with the name Sophia. It's been granted citizenship in Saudi Arabia and perhaps a few other places. I will actually be working with those people in a couple of months a project in Warsaw, but the very first robot that was built by Hanson Robotics was a Philip K. Dick robot. And so this concern about humans uh, is at the core of both Wiener and Philip K. Dick's um, early writings. Dreyfus is the one who wrote What Computers Can't Do in 72 and then followed it up in 92 with the still can't do. Uh, these are also very helpful uh, uh, treatments of the topic. And as I noted before, he was a Heide Heidegger scholar. Uh, Heidegger, of course, is, is the cornerstone for many people of what we now call phenomenology. Phenomenology is in many respects, the uh, Catholic church without the church. Heidegger, personally wanted to become a, a Jesuit uh, theologian until the church circled the wagons. And so in that Heidegger world, you're getting another version of natural law coming through with his concerns um, about being uh, and the rest. Th those are fundamentally the so same sort of issues that the church was dealing with in natural law. And that's what's missing. So as we've described these media environments, we call them paradigm shifts. And paradigms, as you recall, um, require uh, new sciences. And we're absolutely in that situation. So one answer to the question, what is missing, is science is missing. We've gone off the track by deliberately ignoring natural law, and instead trying to figure out how to organize society around our own designs. That is not going to work. And one of the biggest problems with that is it removes our capacity to have a coherent image of the future. If everything is socially constructed, if it's merely a matter of 
the stories we tell ourselves. Narrative is not the same as story. Stories are make-believe, and if we can make-believe what we want, describe society in that way, then the future no longer exists. We're, we're in the process of inventing it all the way along. And, and that has been a, um, a significant disaster to date. Looking forward to Q&A on that topic as well. Next slide, please. Okay, I know this is something that Bill uh, and I have talked about for many hours. The question uh, in the uh, terms used by AI researchers is, in order for, so you're, you're all familiar, I suppose, with some version of uh, something called a singularity. So um, once upon a time, MIT AI researcher, Ray Kurzweil, uh, initially he built a braille machine and then he built a, a keyboard, um, electronic uh, piano keyboard. Uh, and then he started publishing stuff and uh, he's a, a fairly well-known name at this point. Um, his uh, adoption of the term um, uh, singularity, which actually was not his coinage, but nonetheless has spun into Singularity University and so forth. Th this is all based around an inevitability that the information processing capability of machines must at some point exceed humans. That is only important if in fact humans are information processors, which as, as we've noted already here, is absolutely not our view about humans. But for those who are dominant within these fields, um, that becomes uh, a, uh, a target that people are, feel comfortable putting 20 years, 30 years, but it's gotta happen sometime. My answer to the question is no. Using the techniques that are underway right now without some absolutely fundamental breakthrough, AGI will not be achieved. I will extend that. I will say even with breakthroughs, the notion that we're going to be able to actually build something which is a human replacement in terms of intelligence is a bizarre and and clearly failing notion. Uh, the next three bullets here, Josiah Pearl, uh, Eric Larson, and uh, a man who is not known publicly. Uh, his, his name is Yang. Um, he runs the university in China. Uh, I've had some extensive conversations about him. They have all come up with their answers. Pearl wants to recover causality. So you'll see when I get the bibliography written, that means a book uh, entitled The Book of Why. However, the causality that Pearl wants to retrieve turns out to be completely inadequate to the task. It will not work. Eric Larson has written a fascinating book entitled The Myth of Artificial Intelligence. He has suggested we need to return to what um, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce would have called um, um, abductive logic, where deductive and inductive logic are inadequate. And he goes through in some great length how those are the techniques that have been used in old and new AI research, expert systems, if you will, deductive, machine learning, inductive. His claim is that no, we need to move on to a different kind of logic. That also will not accomplish the goal. The Chinese researcher, um, uh, things have, of course, become quite difficult in terms of continuing exchanges uh, with China over the cross course of the last couple of years. I don't know if that's going to turn around and get much better. But his goal was effectively to build a robot that could do what uh, Chinese culture could do which would be to perform the I Ching. Based on my interactions with him and others in China, this will not work either. So from our standpoint, because the human being is not understood, an attempt to build a machine that can duplicate a human being cannot possibly be done. In particular, 
as I've already noted, pattern recognition is not going to close this deal. Human beings are not in the pattern recognition business any more than information processing. We recognize forms, and this is why the whole topic of faculty psychology that we dealt with last week is so important. Next slide, please. We probably could have figured out a better way to describe these things. We have the um, digital environment, we have the digital sphere, we have digital Catholic social teaching. So as you can see, our imagination is, is uh, um, lacking here, everything we just add digital to. But nonetheless, I will try to go through a description of what we think of as a digital sphere. Uh, my guess from interacting with this group is that there's not a lot of uh, academic philosophy department types who are involved with this. But if you were to take a look at what happened to postmodernism, so you're probably familiar with at least references to this, primarily in the English speaking, Anglophonic world referring back to 60s and 70s French philosophers, that has largely washed away. The tide has gone out, postmodernism has gone with it in most cases, but it's been replaced by a much more pernicious and ultimately um, much more significant in terms of this paradigm change called posthumanism. Uh, Sometimes it's paired with transhumanism. And uh, this is uh, something which has become so widespread that there are multiple journals, multiple international conferences, um, the sort of thing that happens off on the side that you may not pay attention to. But nonetheless, this effort to figure out what comes after human beings is the next stage, if you will, in this electric effort to reform human nature. And as I indicated before, I'm involved with a, with a project in Warsaw uh, in which uh, an attempt will be made to understand algorithmically how compassion can be programmed into artificial intelligence based upon the people who have been working on this and their depth of understanding of these problems, uh, this will be very uh, interesting to see how this uh, develops. Uh, compassion, uh, as Philip K. Dick uh, indicated in um, uh, Do Android Stream of Electric Sheep, uh, later Blade Runner, uh, this is, is obviously a different way of talking about AI. It's not an intelligence. It is more of an emotional component. Same problems. If you do not understand how compassion arises amongst humans, and moreover, if you don't understand what a human being is, then you're in very deep trouble uh, trying to figure out how to program compassion. Another marker of this, uh, so in other words, this point here is to say that AI research has come to recognize that they're lacking a great deal. They're, they haven't been able to step up to a human level. So increasingly efforts are being put in to try to add what is unique about humans by people who really don't understand humans into these AIs. But nonetheless, this is, this is an ongoing effort. Another example here, there are probably a number of people here who are fans of uh, space exploration. Um, you may be a fan of uh, Elon Musk. You may be a fan of Jeff Bezos. You may be a fan of Richard Branson and so forth. Um, underneath that, so that's the, 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 the glittery, uh, shiny object. That, that's the amusing yourself to death dimension of this. But underneath this, as you likely recognize, is that space exploration is being promoted because planet Earth is irredeemable. So the notion of trying to make human beings a intergalactic species, 
lacks, again, the fundamentals of what it means to be human, and yet it is getting an enormous amount of attention and will continue to. All of this we would consider, uh, and in particular, uh, as we described the three spheres, East, West, and Digital, in another course that Srikant organized uh, with us last year, uh, these are effectively alchemical transformations. Th these are akin to the transformation of lead into gold. So as those of you who have studied anything about the history of alchemy, or may even be involved today, you will know that alchemy, as it is typically described in terms of base metal into gold as a way of, of funding uh, various efforts, as a way of becoming rich, um, that was never the primary focus in our view of these alchemical efforts, either in East or West. And by the way, there's a very rich Eastern Taoist uh, alchemical uh, tradition. So those who are on this call who may think of themselves as Taoists or Taoist leaning might want to take a look into Nadan, uh, which is the internal alchemy. So there is an alchemical transformation here, starting with the presumption that there's something fundamentally flawed about human beings. Now we're going to describe them as machines that can be re-engineered or as computers that can be reprogrammed because of this fundamental flaw. You might think of that in Western civilizational terms as the fall, as it is described in Genesis. And so if we're going to follow Joni Mitchell's instructions and get back to the garden, we're gonna to have to become something different. We're gonna to have to alchemically transform humanity. And the specific term that we've adopted to describe that transformation is uh, for us to become gods. An uh, old friend of mine, John Markoff, has just published a biography of Stuart Brand the title of it, of it is uh, The Whole Earth. Um, and if you're interested in Stuart Brand and, and want to follow that particular bouncing ball, um, you, will, you will wind up pursuing the meaning of the phrase that initiated the uh, Whole Earth catalog. We are as gods uh, and might as well get good at it. Uh, no, my friends, we are not gods. <laughs> we are humans, and we might as well get good at being humans. That's the challenge we now have. Next slide, please. Well, we're doing pretty well on time here. Uh, I, will, uh, I will go through this. Some of these uh, topics have been discussed uh, in earlier sessions. Um, it is our very strong commitment that not only are we not robots, but as humans, we already have a basis for restructuring our understanding of humanity, civilization, society. And that is, the, for Westerners, that is a retrieval of natural law. The primary expression of natural law in the West are the virtues. So you will find a wide variety of materials by people talking about courage, um, talking about uh, wisdom, talking about temperance. Um, I will go into the topic of virtues uh, next week uh, in one of the slides as we start talking about subsidiarity and begin to unravel some of these aspects of natural law. The East is not the same. As we described in our earlier classes on the East, it is not the virtues, but rather the way, the Tao if you will, which is being sought, uh, very aggressively being sought and appropriately under this paradigm shift. In this whole effort, science will necessarily be reconstructed. Neuroscience is an area that I think is going to be enormously important as we begin to tease out the faculties of the human mind. Um, uh, Bill and I got into a conversation uh, with a, um, a Silicon Valley uh, a character, I, I don't need to uh, name him, um, who has devoted his fortune 
uh, to neuroscience and is barking up the wrong tree. Um, probably fortunately uh, for us, he decided not to have a conversation with us about this because he already knows what he's looking for. He's thinking that every single one of the, uh, so that the uh, structure of the human brain is uh, uh, internally a whole series of relatively well-defined areas with uh, capabilities that are, can be listed and locations that can be assigned to various um, uh, senses and emotions and so forth. Uh, sometimes this is uh, just uh, summarized as the midbrain. Um, you'll hear people talking about the uh, amygdala and so forth. That's a very different structure than the neocortex. Uh, this particular researcher is attempting to understand how each individual neuronal cell, which reaches from the outside way into the inside and then all sorts of internal connections, is itself a kind of a very small computer, information processors uh, on a massive scale and trying to understand how they interconnect and, and so forth. This is fundamentally from the premise level wrong, cannot work. And so therefore neuroscience is going to have to rethink all of these efforts, but it goes much broader than that. Uh, social science as it was reinvented because we've always had a version of social science, but the social science that came to us in the electric environment was one which attempted to reduce human beings in such a way that they could be manipulated and organized that has failed. So social science built around in particular in more recent years, something called constructivism, which is to say we can make up any story we want and describe the world as if, that will be discarded. And so uh, I wanna complete uh, today's discussion and we'll move on to Q&A. Again, by underscoring the fact that human beings are not information processors, they're not robots. Um, there's an enormous amount of money chasing the wrong problems here. There's a whole lot of um, learning that would be needed um, for us to avoid this. And I'm hoping some of that comes up in Q and A. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Mark. All right, folks, so it's time for Q and A. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark to put your question on the table. We'll be collecting all the questions. We'll be organizing them and then Mark will be answering all of them. So go ahead and type an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom in order to ask your questions. Peter, uh, Peter's question. Peter, do you want to um, unmute and ask the question? Um, I asked it in chat. Um... Okay, there is a problem with your audio. So let me uh, let me speak it out. I'm in a let, little book. Let, yeah, let, let me go ahead and speak it out. Um, so uh, Peter's question is, where does dignity enter the picture? Why does it matter? Um, the main uh, idea behind both these sections, to, today's section and section three was human dignity. So yeah. where does that come in? So that's question number one. Um, Mike, what's your question? Folks, go ahead and type exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom in order to put your questions on the table. Mike, go ahead, what's your question? Well, a major premise of your thesis is that uh, uh, human beings think different, uh, think so complexly, compl high complexity, that um, a uh, machine is never gonna be able to match that. And I, I, I feel that that's a, um, uh, a statement that cars can never walk like a human being that because they have wheels rather than knee joints. And I, um, there's a bunch of follow-ups that I'd like, there's at least one follow-up I'd like to make after I hear your answer. Thank right. you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike. So I'll put that as um, is the difference between 
human beings and computers, the complexity, and is that your primary differentiation between human beings and uh, computers? Uh, next well, up is to, going to be- They may that? be able to solve the problems that of humanity and, uh, and, the, and the theory of everything, but they won't do it the same way we do it. So Thank that you. way we can get AGI in a different fashion. Thank you. Uh, so the question is, can computers do everything that human beings do, but differently? Next up is going to be Alejandro. Alejandro, go ahead, unmute and ask the question because some people can't yes. uh, read uh, the chat. Go ahead. My question is, what is the difference between intelligence and wisdom? Wonderful. Since that we are in a race for intelligence, but what is the wisdom then? Excellent, excellent Thank question. Thank you. Thank you, Ale Alejandro. All right, uh, any more questions? Um, let me give up, give 10 more seconds. I want to ask the question, uh, th there was a very intriguing statement, uh, Mark, you made about um, Heidegger, saying that Heidegger and phenomenology is Catholic church without the church. So I want to put that as a question uh, about Heidegger. Peter has a follow-up. He says, uh, what can be done to assert human dignity in a digital condition that wasn't possible before? Fantastic question. Okay, so let us start. Uh, folks, you are welcome to keep asking questions. Go ahead and type your questions now directly into the chat and I will go ahead and incorporate them uh, into the questions. So the first question, let's start with the human dignity. What is human dignity? <clears throat> and what is possible to uphold human dignity in digital conditions, which was not possible before. Right. Um, as we have previously described, a human civilization comes about as a result of the transition from a pre-literate oral environment to a literate scribal environment. The normal Approach to this is to describe it as the axial age. Axial age is spreading out depending on who you talk to over centuries, but 500 BC is a reasonable approximation. So what happened in 500 BC? In the West, there are other things that are happening in the East, but let's approach this topic of human dignity from the standpoint of Western understanding. The straightforward answer to that question, of course, is the Old Testament was finally written down initially as a result of the Babylonian captivity of the Hebrews. Uh, but Genesis is the origin story of Western civilization. And as you will rec recall, and if you haven't done this recently, I recommend every uh, once in a while, maybe once a year, maybe every few years, uh, reread the book of Genesis. That, that is about as fundamental as it gets. And you will find in the early chapters, as God is creating humanity, we are creatures created by God in the Western civilization. It is described that human beings are created in the image and likeness of God, uniquely, separating us from all the other creatures. And that in and of itself should begin to answer the question for you about human dignity. But let me fast forward here. Marshall McLuhan, as many of you recall, is a fundamental component of the work that we're doing at the center. Marshall McLuhan's most famous book is Understanding Media, the Extensions of Man. So this notion that that process is a one of extension, that human inventions are extending ourselves, translates into what are human beings an extension of? So to reduce humanity, to nothing but an animal is something we dealt with last week. We can come back to this as many times as you'd like to. It is akin to the reduction of human beings to machines or the human beings to computers. Every one of these 
reductions um, fundamentally excludes the critical components because they cannot be brought into that descriptive framework. So Peter, the answer to your question is, humans deserve dignity because they are more than mere animals. They are not machines, they're not computers. They are in fact an extension of their creator as Western civilization understands this. I understand there are plenty of people here who instead subscribe to various Eastern religions or no religion at all. I understand there are many people in this audience who are uh, secularists, people who think that the uh, uh, organized religion is the, the source of all um, evil in society. I understand that. But we're dealing here with a sphere that is in crisis. That crisis requires us to remember. And in the process of remembering what it means to be human, we will stumble across this extension of making us in the image and likeness of God that is in the book of Genesis, which I recommend again uh, for you to read uh, periodically. So, uh, Peter, the answer to your question is, we are exceptional. We are absolutely unique in all of existence, as far as we know. And it is because of that unique set of qualities that we have uh, dignity as human persons. This is a, 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 a fundamental basis. And so to the extent that there are people here uh, in this audience who are upset that innocent Ukrainians and innocent Russians are dying in a conflict, you have to ask yourself, why does that bother you? What is your concern about innocent human beings? And where does your understanding of the dignity of human life come from? And my assertion is that it is quite fundamental to the Western sphere, which is where we all reside. Wonderful. Uh, the follow-up question that uh, Peter had was, what can be done to assert human dignity in the digital conditions that right. wasn't possible before? That's an excellent question. Thank you, Peter. And the answer to that question is confronting a world it is hell-bent on creating artificial humans, which was never true before. We, yes, the word robot was invented in the 1920s in a, a Czech play, um, um, uh, quite fascinating uh, play, as, as uh, you might imagine, the 1920s, very different uh, sort of staging. But Rossum's universal robot is where that term entered into the language. Uh, I believe it was a Czech playwright, um, but that was science fiction. H.G. Uh, Wells's uh, time machine, taking us out to the Morlocks and the Eloi, where the Morlocks are the robots uh, living underground, the Eloi are the remnants of humans who wind up being lunch for the Morlocks. There's been plenty of fictional treatment of this topic, but it never became real. It never became a confrontation until digital conditions. So human dignity necessarily rises in a way that it has been discarded in particular around the notion that human beings are just information processors. There's no dignity in, in that. Um, moving away from those reductions and retrieving a true understanding of what human beings actually constitute, that is the basis for a much more robust understanding of human dignity and it's only possible at our digital conditions. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next, we'll take the question from Alejandro. What is the difference between intelligence and wisdom? <clears throat> How does it apply to this discussion? of human dignity and artificial humanity. Right. Uh, Alejandro, thank you very much. Um, obviously, uh, information comes from 
the references that I was beginning to describe, which is in particular um, information theory and its attempt to systematize uh, biology. So information is a characteristic which is thought to be uh, spread across um, every life form, every aspect of, of the universe. There's nothing um, uh, specific about human beings in terms of information or the intelligence associated with it. Wisdom, on the other hand, is not something that you would attribute to a computer. Wisdom is something that uh, necessarily uh, winds up being assigned to humans and has been discussed over millennia. Uh, as it turns out, the term intelligence, uh, I would challenge anybody here who's interested to come up with a concise and broadly agreed upon definition of intelligence. I've tried. I've read hundreds of, of articles and treatments of this. Um, it's simply not there. Um, you might well argue that wisdom has also had many different definitions and plenty of argument about it. And yet the fact that wisdom is something that human beings might possess, whereas intelligence is something that you could assign to a machine or a computer, that is the distinction. And so the shift to artificial intelligence in the 1950s, as it turns out, uh, many of the engineers who were involved with this um, were very uh, deliberate in their descriptions about how they wanted to replace humans. They could have called it artificial wisdom, but that obviously wouldn't have gotten them anywhere. So this vague, undefined, open-ended, and ultimately failing term, artificial intelligence, is what got substituted for that. Um, Answer to your question, Alejandro, is you don't need to be human to be intelligent as people uh, fumble around with a definition. You have to be human to be wise. Excellent. Uh, next question is from Bill. Bill, could you go ahead and unmute and ask your question? Yeah, before I do, let me ask Mark. I'm dying to pick up our last conversation where we left off. Should we give it a try here or is that asking too much? Uh, ask a last question, uh, a last conversation in this session? No, a private conversation before this session. This, this it was, week, it was a Wolfram conversation. And so, Bill, I think the way this is structured, um, asking a question and then uh, my answering and you coming back and, and so forth is probably the best way to do it. But we have a limited time frame here. So uh, um, try so to uh, hit it out of the ballpark here. Your, your call. I mean, you saw it's a lengthy question. All right. So. I'll give it a shot and we could call it off if it's not working. But Wolfram's elucidation of computational irreducibility is a, is a proper confession that reductionist science seeking closed form, complete mathematical descriptions of reality is not possible. I think he proved that, right? And, and Gödel took the first shot at it, but I always looked at Gödel's incompletely theorem as a, as a parlor game, a linguistic trick, whereas Wolfram actually did the work. He said, listen, Everything we think we knew about physics and mathematics is not going to work here. Something different is going on. What he didn't do was take the next step. What you picked up is that he never really went back to re-examine the nature of causality, particularly formal and final cause. And it's so tantalizing because he mentions it in his last talk, but then he doesn't spend any time on it. So here's my question. Can someone pick up where Wolfram left off with this new kind of science, add an understanding of formal and final cause, properly define emergence, and sort of solve the riddle of understanding reality, even if it leaves us without the ability to forecast it. Right. Yeah, the, the answer to that question is yes. So th this is, uh, but let me fill in the blank here. As you recall, when we're talking about Stephen Wolfram, who you have um, exchanged with, and uh, so your knowledge of, of Wolfram and relationship with him is much stronger than mine. But what I found really fascinating about Wolfram who I do consider to be a, uh, if not a protege, certainly somebody who is following in the, in the footsteps of Kurt Gödel. Um, as you recall, Kurt Gödel um, sort of went off the deep end, specifically on the topic of Gottfried Leibniz. As it turns out, Stephen Wolfram 
has taken that the next step. I believe Wolfram has described, because he does a fair amount of autobiographic, uh, confessional sort of material, um, that uh, lecture that you sent me to, I enjoyed uh, very much. It's a, it's a somewhat rambling, uh, why did I write this book and what's happened to me since then? But nonetheless, embedded within that is Leibniz. And Leibniz becomes the key figure for exactly what you're talking about. So when, when my godfather, Norbert Wiener, came to MIT, he wound up writing an article for the journal, which is still MIT journal, the Tech Review. Wiener's article was titled, Let's Get Back to Leibniz. Yes, somebody should in fact do exactly what you suggested. My guess is it will not be Stephen Wolfram, but there's a lot of smart people out there that have been following in his trail along with many others. And so what I, you're muted, Bill, sorry. Uh, just a second, uh, I'm gonna unmute uh, Bill. Go ahead, Bill. You had a follow up, uh, you need to unmute. Yes. Wol Wolfram's got a whole posse of scientists following him now. And right. what they're trying yeah. to do is basically recreate using his techniques, all of Newton, right? And then do Einstein and then do quantum. But the, he doesn't have any philosophers following him. He needs philosophers to follow him. Well, no, he needs someone to follow him who understands that, that Newton was an idiot. <laughs> and that Newton's primary <laughs> rival okay, was, was- Just a second. Uh, what, yeah, go ahead. Remember what Newton spent most of his life doing. You, you do know that Newton spent most of his life trying to figure out the date of the end of the world. That's idiotic. And, and he did it by calculating from the Old Testament, which makes it even more stupid. So Newton is not the right person to try to recreate. Leibniz is the right person to recreate. So what's going to happen here, I suspect, is that somebody from that large cloud of people around Stephen Wolfram it's going to dawn on them someday. They're going to recognize the structure of this. If the um, primary influence that brought Kurt Gödel to what is a straightforward mathematical presentation, but yes, it doesn't play very well in cocktail parties, um, and therefore the the so Wolfram spent two weeks in the Leibniz archives. There's a massive amount of Leibniz that's never been published. Gödel thought there were some breakthrough secrets in there. Well, let me, let me tell you, Leibniz is natural law. So if you were to say, no, 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 no. Remember, we've got Newton and Leibniz supposedly rivals over the topic of who invented the calculus. That's nonsense. That's not why they were rivals. They're rivals because they were coming from completely different bases. Newton was an alchemist. Leibniz uh, was a transitional figure from a scribal to a print world who was offered the job to run the Vatican Library. So when people in Wolfram's world understand that, that neither Kurt Gödel nor Stephen Wolfram were up to the task of understanding Leibniz in relationship to these questions, so I'm, I'm agreeing with you that somebody with a philosophical bent, uh, not a mathematical one, will be needed for this. But Wolfram is a, a very wide ranging intellectual. I enjoy reading his stuff and he talks about a, a, a lot of very important topics. So when th that person or group of people come along in the Wolfram world, they will wind up not trying to recreate Newton or Einstein, but rather Leibniz. And I believe that's where the answer lies. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Bill. Um, next, let's take the question from Mike. Um, he asked, I'm going to try to paraphrase it, par paraphrase it in a couple of ways. One is that he's asking, um, are you saying that the machines have not yet achieved the complexity needed to do what human beings can do? Uh, that's one kind of a question. The second kind of question, is it that is it possible that at some point machines will be able to do everything that human beings can do except in a different way? Go ahead. 
Um, the answer to the first question is no. And the answer to the second question is yes. Let me elaborate. Um, complexity is of itself uh, a, a highly loaded and difficult term. As, uh, as Bill uh, prefaced his question, we need a redefinition of emergence. Absolutely true. I'm actually working with some people to try to figure out how to do that. It turns out that complexity is an appropriate term if what you're dealing with can be reduced to mathematical equations. It turns out that most interesting things in life, very much like the Wolfram situation. So Wolfram has this computational irreducibility. It turns out that in the complexity science world, they have deliberately carved out the distinction between complexity and complicated. So social problems, human problems, psychological problems cannot be solved with complexity theory. They can, however, be addressed in a much broader sense of understanding uh, complexity. I'm sorry, uh, uh, complicated. And, and so though, that is a, ref, a reform of that science, which is now underway to limit uh, complexity. So that's the um, first question. Second question, however, um, I think it's absolutely likely that we will wind up with remarkable, wind up with, we already have remarkable machine uh, operations. They're not human. They never will be human. Um, it's highly unlikely, as I indicated in my earlier slide, that those who are pursuing this research will understand what it means to be human, because if they did that, they would recognize there's a fundamental problem here. And here I will draw on the distinction between patterns and forms. Pattern recognition is what machines can do. Understanding forms is what humans can do. A form is not complex. A form is complicated. The effort to try to apply complexity science to human psychology, psyche here being the Greek term for what we call in English the soul, the form of the human being, have been a complete failure, as best I can tell. So we're, we're dealing here with two different realms, or I guess this might be what some would call a category mistake. What the machine can do uh, is a quite different phenomenon. And so, uh, again, the answer to your question is complexity is probably the wrong way to think about this. Think instead in terms of, of complicated, but um, the, the net result of this is the difference between humans and machines um, is dawning on people. It is, it is quite surprising when you wade into these conversations, how people have, be, it, it's begun to hit the, the top AI researchers. Exactly the question that you're asking, maybe that's where it stems from, or you uh, intuited that that's where we're heading. The machines are not the same, and um, that recognition uh, will roll through the field of artificial intelligence and have massive impact on how people approach these topics. You don't need to be human being to build a smart bomb. You don't need to be human being to put a robot in, in the, into warfare. And uh, that recognition uh, is, uh, I think, becoming clearer every day. Uh, Debbie had a follow-up question. What is the difference between complicated and complexity? <laughs> um, <clears throat> the basic answer to that question is uh, uh, complicated. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, complexity is a specific um, research domain started by uh, the Department of Energy specifically headquartered in a place called the Santa Fe Institute. So it is a discipline. Complexity is a specific discipline that's been around now 
uh, for 40 or so years. It grew out of chaos uh, theory. So there are uh, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people who are studying complexity and they have uniformly failed to um, accurately understand, uh, predict, uh, or in their minds, uh, control, manipulate human beings. Within that field, which is relatively well-defined by its practitioners and grants and, and uh, stars, a handful of people have emerged and said, no, 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 wait a minute. And so, so they will actually describe this in mathematical terms. Complexity works for really simple things. Complexity works for dead things. Complexity works for really big things, but uh, it doesn't work for living things. That is the conclusion that they're more and more coming to. So Debbie, the answer to your question is, what is the difference between living and dead? What is life? Um, that is a complicated question. Wonderful. Um, Chris, did you have a very short question? Go ahead and you can ask the question. Go ahead. Uh, Chris, go ahead, you are unmuted. Okay, there is a problem with his audio looks like. Okay, um, so let me ask a follow-up question. Um, I think the heart of what we keep coming back to across all these sessions is that the computers can't do formal cause or final cause. Um, so, and the like mo most modern mind, you know, most people who are used to the modern thinking, they think primarily in terms of material causes and efficient causes, and they can't really, the, the formal causes and final causes don't really register for them. So can you talk a little bit about what sure. formal and final cause is sure. and how does it relate to this topic about what human beings can do and what uh, machines can do? Um, here I will drop a name uh, who may be familiar to some of you because he's uh, been making a lot of public statements. The name is Jim Rutt. Jim Rutt was the chairman for many years of the Santa Fe Institute. So as I answered Debbie, complexity science is a discipline with the headquarters. And he was the chairman of the headquarters. So when I first met Jim Rutt, who was a very intelligent, very dynamic, very opinionated character, as Bill nods his head, because he's also been working with this character, and I don't want to um, offend him, if he happens to listen to this, I'm just telling the story. Debbie and I had lunch with Jim and his wife. And in the midst of that conversation, this topic of formal causality came up. Well-educated, widely read, lives inside a big uh, library, has had um, large budgets and dozens of the smartest people in the world working for him. And his answer was, What's that? I never heard of that before. He never heard of it. And he said, if you can convert whatever you think formal causality into a mathematical statement, then I'll pay attention. If, if you can't do that, then don't bother me with this bullshit. Uh, as it turns out, Aristotle's four causes, particularly as they are laid out in Aristotle's uh, book, uh, uh, The Physics, were widely agreed upon throughout the scribal age in the West. So that means from some point, fourth century or more BC, all the way up into probably the 16th century uh, AD. And then the challenges started coming in. And so the question of whether these should even be considered or challenged in a series of statements, David Hume is a particularly important signpost along the way. But by the time we get to the end of the 19th and the 20th century, all of these causalities are being set aside. And so we literally have generations, multiple generations of people who have never even heard of these things. 
So the form is not something that can be quantified. If your approach to these topics is it must be expressible in a mathematical formula because mathematics is univocal. Problem with human language, of course, is it's equivocal. So it's unclear exactly what we mean by words like form, intelligence, wisdom, and so forth. These things have many potential meanings, but formulas uh, are straightforward and the language associated with it is presumed to be straightforward. Even if we can't see a quark, the formula says there's got to be a quark. So we design some test equipment and then we interpret the results of that and say, aha, there's the quark. Well, does the quark exist? It isn't necessary for the mathematical approach to have these objects sensible to us. They can be abstract and not uh, uh, sensible in, in, in that way. Uh, and, and so uh, the four forms of causality, uh, Srikant is exactly right. A material uh, causality is the property of the matter from which we are made. So in the case of human beings, obviously there's an atomic structure to us, but probably more importantly, there's a cellular structure associated with us. That's the material uh, uh, of which we are made. But the cell is not simply matter, it has form. And so the material, the efficient billiard board type causality have to be supplemented by an understanding of forms, which we have largely lost in the West, not in the East. This is one of the most important distinctions between the West sphere and the East sphere. The East sphere never gave up on forms. The Tao, the way, is a form. It's not a pattern. Uh, but final cause, uh, as Srikant has emphasized here, also needs to be taken into account. One of the bullet points was, um, we have lost our ability to construct an image of the future. What is the teleology? What is the purposefulness of our life? This is a, probably the single greatest um, difficulty behind the current chaos in which we're living. The notion that we're all going to try to go to democracy, that's out the window. The notion that we're all gonna to try to go to freedom, that's out the window. Um, Bill Fres is engaged in a remarkable effort at, at, uh, 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 all over the place um, to try to uh, emphasize the importance of freedom. And uh, I give him all the support I can in doing that. And yet he would be the first to admit that the notion that our future inevitably heads towards more freedom maximizing freedom, that is impossible to believe anymore. So we have, we have lost our ability to project into the future, way beyond our own lives, a, uh, a telos. We're going to have to reconstruct that. There is no alternative. Human civilization cannot exist without a purpose, and we're going to rebuild that, I'm quite sure, under digital conditions. Wonderful. Um, I want to use my moderator's privilege to follow up on one of the questions, because I think uh, I want to make this series accessible to people who are not necessarily familiar with the entire Catholic uh, corpus, but sure. are familiar with kinds of issues. You made the most intriguing statement that Heidegger is right, Catholic right. Church without uh, right. without the church. Could you elaborate on that? Because many people sure. are familiar with Heidegger, but not with the entire corpus of the Catholic Church. So if you go back to the very first session in this course, Digital Catholic Social Teaching, what I ran through was the enormous difficulties faced by the church in the 19th and early 20th century. So it's very understandable that well-educated, well-meaning, 
21st century people are not familiar with the Catholic corpus because it has largely been pushed aside. That was not true yet in the early 20th century. So uh, a whole field of inquiry grew up around Edmund Husserl and Edith Stein and uh, Martin Heidegger and many others known as phenomenology. Phenomenology was a uh, predecessor, many would say, to existentialism, but it was um, and continues to be uh, Merleau-Ponty and others. This is a major component of continental philosophy in the 20th century. Where did it come from? <laughs> what, what caused this phenomenology thing to happen? And my answer to that question is, Simultaneous with the withdrawal of the Catholic Church from uh, public philosophical and scientific debates on these things, a kind of a vacuum was created for those who would like to carry forward aspects of natural law, particularly aspects of natural law as we experience the world. So the name phenomenology obviously comes from phenomenon and phenomenon are what we experience. So how we experience the world and the structure of that world is at the core of this. And so it, I would describe this as a situation in which the Catholic Church uh, withdrew, it circled the wagons, it declared itself an, an enemy of the modern age. This specifically came up in great detail under Pope Pius X, for those who'd like to trace the history here. And that is where Martin Heidegger enters into the picture. Martin Heidegger is a student. Martin Heidegger is heading towards his career when it hits a fan. And that hitting of the fan, in particular, something called the Oath Against Modernism, which has its own Wikipedia page, caught out Martin Heidegger. He would not be able to, I believe what he was trying to do was become the modern Aquinas. It was impossible to do that in the context of the church. And so he wound up elsewhere. Um, the Husserl archives are located in the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. The close association between phenomenology and the church extended all the way into Vatican II. There's some very important phenomenological components that fed into how Vatican II developed. So I would consider uh, the, the Catholic corpus, which is for all the reasons that we've cited here, largely unknown. So part of the reason for this course is to try to interest some people, few people, more people in exploring this. Again, I'm not here trying to evangelize. I'm not here trying to convert. I'm just here trying to try point out to people that these questions have been dealt with over long periods of time by smart people. And they have put together coherent approaches to these issues under the heading of Catholic social teaching and therefore introducing that. But the 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 if you will the the outside the church and therefore far more significant in terms of intellectual history by most people's accounts in the 20th century, phenomenology becomes the replacement, um, primary replacement uh, for the Catholic Church. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, can you uh, give a preview of what is coming up in the next session? Well, we're going to have uh, even more fun, if possible. <laughs> It turns out that uh, humans and robots is a, is a topic that you probably have all read many articles about. And, uh, and so what we've done here is we did two sessions, which were backgrounders. We've now completed two sessions on human dignity. Now we're heading into the, the home stretch, so to speak. We're gonna do two sessions on subsidiarity, a term that most of you have never heard of. So I will try to give you some background on that, try to indicate to you next week where that comes from, how that relates to virtue in particular, how important that is for structuring 
the economy and politics. We will then, two weeks from today, go into how this is likely to play out under digital conditions. Uh, we'll then complete the eight weeks, with two weeks with the same pattern, give me the basic ideas, give me the context for this, and then tell me how this functions in a digital world. That will wind up being on the topic of solidarity, and in that we will be um, very thankfully uh, joined uh, by a guest uh, who's here on the screen, Victor Gaitan, author of a very important book, uh, God's Diplomats, which I recommend to all of you. Uh, so we've got four more weeks to go. We have two more topics to discuss. Each of them have two weeks. Um, I'm having a, a great time in preparing this and in interacting with all of you. I encourage you all, if you didn't get a chance to get your question answered here, or you want to think about it some more, three kind of structured things. So there's a ongoing capability of q and A. I'm following his guidance in terms of how I participate in that. I'm very much looking forward to seeing you next week and in conversing with you on these subjects uh, between now and then. Again, thank you all very much. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And I have put the link to the page for the Scribal Hyperbook for this course. There you will find both or, you know, videos for the previous sessions, that's number one all the slides for all the sessions. Uh, the videos are indexed by questions. So you can jump into any question on in any session that you would like. Third, you're going to find bibliographies. Fourth, you're going to find lecture notes for, by Peter Berkman. Those are amazing. Uh, so that's one of my favorite things in these, uh, on, on these pages. So um, as soon as I have this video ready, I will put the video there and questions. At the bottom of the page, there is a place where you can ask questions and you can put your comments. So please go ahead and do that. Mark reads it and he will respond to, uh, to it as well. We'll also incorporate, so if there is a pattern that comes up, we will incorporate that into these meetups. So please go ahead uh, and click on the link now that is in the chat so you can start interacting with us offline. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Great questions and thank you, Mark, as always. Bye.